Uh, so I stopped and I thought for a while, well, what is really best in life for me? Is it making really fast databases? I mean, we've made Volt, Volt does a million transactions a second in a commodity cluster. Really, really fast database. My dog, Banjo. I do really love Banjo. Ah, oh, thank you. I know. She's, she's cuter than I am, that's for sure. And she loves playing fetch. So maybe what's best in life is fast databases and a tennis ball? I don't know. I needed a more technical answer than that. So what I really enjoy doing, the reason I started working at Volt, the reason I show up every day, the reason I uh, come down to New York, even though the Red Sox are playing World Series game number two miles from my house. That's <laughs> Super Mars great, but so what I really like to do is I really like to make products. And uh, as introduced, I worked at I worked at Lucent. Actually, I worked for uh, Cascade and Ascend, which were eventually acquired by Lucent. We made telecommunications gear. Um, if you've ever sent data across AT's data network and it arrived, that all we touch software I wrote didn't arrive. It's planting our responsibility. Uh, I worked also at Data Power, which was uh, an XML processing middleware company that IBM bought, and uh, we wrote web services security software. So if you do Bank of America ATM transactions, at least up to three years ago, I don't know recently what they're doing, you actually touch software I wrote. And that's really interesting, making, making tools that affect the world. I think that that's actually something that I, that I think is what I really enjoy doing. I kind of like making uh, um, tools fit together to a certain point in time into a certain ecosystem of other emerging technologies that change the world somehow, right? That make the world a little bit better. And that's going to sound really egotistical. The reason I like doing that um, kind of under the covers is because I, I actually prefer to do it privately. I'm not really a consumer kind of iPhone kind of guy. So what does it, what, what do you think about data management? Like what's, what's the history? Right? What's it leading up to? And in the context of our liking to make products that sort of hit the intersection of emerging technologies, what's the big picture space around data management? Well, in the 1970s and 1980s, databases were largely used for really boring tasks, which is really boring today, right? Basic inventory control, agent typing away at a green screen, booking a, some, some flight for you, right? This was all, all really pretty simple, right? VoltDB has kept all of those good things. VoltDB is designed from the beginning to scale on commodity hardware. If you look at how legacy databases were designed, they were designed for computing resources that were fundamentally scarce. Right? In the 1980s, a computer had little memory, wasn't attached to a high-speed network, had tiny, very, very slow disks. Right? Each of us has a phone in our pocket that dwarfs the computing power of even what was available to us on the desktop 15 years ago. Right? And databases designed, however, never really readapted to that change in technology. Modern CPUs are superfluous. We have more cores than we know what to do with in some circumstances. So how do we manage concurrency to data? Well, it's very different. If you have one core that's very slow, attached to a very slow disk resource, you're going you're to manage data concurrency very differently than if you have 50 cores, all of which are very high speed and have access to high speed memory resources, right? Those two fundamental physical architectures are going to demand a change to your software architecture. VoltDB has responded to that and it's designed a system uh, for really modern computing resources. And as a result, you put these two things together with some other um, decisions that were made in the architecture and you end up with a transactional database that scales uh, in a cloud-friendly way that has extremely differentiated performance. I was to say, um, you know, this is kind of an antique notion um, that you used to want to separate your online transaction processing from your BI stack, essentially for performance reasons, right? You wanted to do e-commerce or something. Then this this seems to kind of turn that upside down. So it looks like your if your relational model is still in the OET, OLTP, it's called a data layer. Um, then that's coexisting side by side with this high speed streaming and event processing. I think what will happen um, is a little bit of that, but I think more of what will happen is that people will build applications to deal with high speed transactions and they're not going to go and change a lot of their traditional business applications as deeply. Um, SAP, right, Hanna is basically a play to build accelerators for some of those applications based around a combination of this technology and memory OLAP technology. So they're trying that. Um, I think that the technology that's being built here is largely going to be a disruptive technology that creates new applications, right? Or that responds to the desire to create new applications, more so than a wholesale replacement of what we're familiar with as our typical business databases. There are some exceptions. So um, 
for example, uh, one of the VoltDB use cases is resource tracking. Uh, and this is, you might consider this traditionally to be a relatively typical problem, right? Where, where are my devices? Where are they located? What's an inventory? Except in this case, the resources being tracked are underground in the world's largest platinum mines. They have tens of thousands of people and pieces of equipment up to a mile deep or something absurd, right? I'm not a geologist, but the numbers are mind boggling. And this mine, across many tiers, many levels, right? And they have put sensors in all of these equipments to be able to manage um, maintenance schedules and emissions and gases. At the same time, they've put sensors in all of their employees, which are currently striking in a violent fashion, but it's not. It's unfortunate, but um, in order to monitor safety, right, is this employee deprived of oxygen or being, or being exposed to, a, to a, a toxin of some kind underground? And at the same time, they've instrumented the location of all of their life-saving equipment underground. So that if there is an emergency in real time, in response to that emergency, they can know exactly where is everyone, where is the safety equipment. Or before that emergency happens, they can detect that something bad is going to happen by seeing a sensor trend, right? So what is the data that this thing creates? Is it typically like what you might think of as, as resource tracking or an inventory problem? Not really. It's tens of thousands of sensors underground, each one creating a reading every 200 milliseconds, right? That's very different. Five times a second times a couple tens of thousand inputs, that's a lot of inputs. Now you're, you, need a, you need an application that can maintain a stateful record of all of these different things, look for dangerous trends against them, while simultaneously handling 50,000 events, 50,000 transactions per second, right? So there's an example where it's hard to say, you know, okay, that's kind of a traditional idea of resource tracking, but it's at a very new scale that necessitates a different technology. Well, it's close to conceptually real-time process monitoring, right? Or status systems. Exactly, yeah. But what, so what differentiates it in a nutshell? Uh, in a nutshell, people are using uh, here a couple of different aspects. One, the ability to, to combine and, and record this data, transact against it, and then archive it, right? Um, and the ability to store like more of it in memory and to deploy it to cloud-based resources. Like, these are the main differences. Yes? You said um, the biggest data management problem is making smart decisions. Would you, would you apply, like, would you say that hard, hard, uh, Mathematical theory, mathematical theory making with with engineering. Like I said, I think NYU Polytechnic was mostly Arabic and Indian. Versus Stanford University, which was mostly English, using students, English American students. Would you say that the hard application of mathematical theory would help in the real time, um, real time and making decisions versus versus the the, the this the soft side of semantics. Of, I mean, I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Um, certainly, better math never hurts, right? I think. Yeah. I think. Um, here's how I think about this. I think of my eleven. One more thing. Uh, <coughs> one of my professors, one of my second semester master's in cybersecurity in Hawaii, he introduced me to this thing called service cyber security. Yeah. And he says. Good to know. So I, I tend to, I, I like to think of, um, I, I like this metaphor. Some people just don't, some people don't like this metaphor, some people do, but I like to share it. I like to think of my online analytics processor store, my archive of all of my historic records. I like to think of that as my source of wisdom, right? It represents all of my memories, everything I've witnessed and seen and collected, right? It's kind of my wisdom, it's the source of my wisdom. And I like to think of my real-time online transaction transaction processing store as my source of action, right? It's how I react in real time, how I make a decision. And these are really two different concepts, right? The collection of my memories versus my ability to act immediately, right? So we look at the patterns from our historical data and using you know, deep mathematical models, right? Machine learning algorithms, uh, scientific correlation finding, clustering finding, all of these kind of, of common statistical techniques, we draw from them uh, hypotheses about how we can have a better impact on our customers or safety or fraud or security, and then we implement those algorithms against something that can act in real time against the events that are coming into place, right? And so that's a little bit about how I think around the, the utility of where the math should sit versus where the decisioning should sit. 
here's some performance numbers to kind of give a background of, of what I'm talking about when I'm saying really fast database. So uh, I don't know why I have negative 50,000 TPS on that axis, and that's PowerPoint being mean to me. But so this is a three node cluster that's been configured to be highly available. So all data in this cluster is replicated once, can tolerate the failure of any one of the three nodes. The only thing in any way exceptional about this is it happened to be networked with 10 gigabit Ethernet instead of gigabit Ethernet. Otherwise, it's just like commodity i7 and white box servers. They're running a workload that varies from 10% read, 90% write, right? extremely write intensive workload, the blue line, to 90% read, 10% write. So relatively cold data that's mutating less frequently. And on the bottom is the number of independent transactions that could be done. So this application is doing relatively simple transactions, kind of an intelligent upsert, so a check, look, and maybe, maybe uh, upsert. Not a ton of SQL involved, but still it's doing about 250,000 transactions a second with client round trip latencies of under five milliseconds, right? So this is kind of the scale of what we mean by that. So this is on three nodes, right? So this is under, $12,000, under $15,000 of the hardware, right? Doing 250,000 transactions per second continuously. Um, we built clusters of 20 to 30 nodes capable of running up to 3 million transactions a second. We built a cluster in Amazon uh, that ran 877,000 transactions per second. A uh, community member built that to test an Erlang client he drew, that he wrote. That's why I know this an Erlang client. Uh, so we're talking about large computing capacity, right? That's a, a really fast, 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 fast database, right? Versus petabytes uh, yeah, of data, we're talking uh, gazillions of transactions, right? So VoltDB, every decision we make in VoltDB is really, in terms of development, is based on one of these concepts. Does it make the system uh, better at transactions? Does it make the system scale better? Does it improve the fault tolerance of the availability story? Um, does it make your data more durable? Does it help with this idea of connecting data to your OLAP system? Um, and some, some WAN replication stuff is probably a little too low level to talk about in this particular point of the conversation. So I want to walk through a little bit, and I'm not sure, I, I guess I've spoken for 40 minutes, and I've been told that I have you guys for like six hours, so. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the technology behind Volt. Um, I'm going to walk through this at a high level. If anyone has detailed questions, please just find me afterwards, and I'd be more than happy to have a, a technical conversation around some of the design decisions in Volt. <laughs> so first of all, Volt, like I've said a few times, it runs on commodity hardware, it runs in a cluster. That means that it partitions data across a cluster, a lot like the NoSQL systems you may be familiar with. So if you're familiar with uh, like a document store that does some kind of distributed hash table sort of organization of data, VoltDB works similarly, except instead of distributing documents across the cluster, we distribute rows from tables. All right, so in VoltDB, uh, you can have a table, you can identify one column or one attribute of that table as your partitioning attribute. That basically means that the value in that row, right, corresponding to that column, is gonna be the key to the hash function that tells you where that row lives in the cluster. So we take a single server, we chop it into a bunch of partition containers, right? Roughly, um, like if you have basically four-fifths to two-thirds of your cores in that box get dedicated to partition containers one-to-one, -one, right? So if I've got eight cores, maybe I have six partition containers on a single server. Each partition container contains slices of the database, right? So a few rows from table one, a few rows from table two, a few rows from table three, right? The organization, which rows go to which container, is determined by this partitioning algorithm that's run against the, against the specified partitioning column. That's a long way of saying the data is organized into shards. <laughs> so number two, clients connect to any node in the database and they start sending transactions to the system. The, the two biggest differences between VoltDB and off-the-shelf kind of commodity uh, database is one, VoltDB is partitioned for scale which I don't think is controversial. And two, uh, VoltDB gets rid of client-side commit control. All right, so in a database that you might be familiar with, you can say from the client, begin transaction, do some SQL, do some SQL, do some SQL, a lot of round trips back and forth to the database, and then commit. If anyone's tried to make a database application scale, you'll know that that causes a lot of internal lock and latch retention, right, on the database itself. You've got all these clients currently holding long-lived transactional contacts in the database. VoltDB doesn't do that. VoltDB, the unit of a transaction, is a single stored procedure call. 
Right? So you can call a Java stored procedure. That stored procedure can combine a pretty arbitrary number of SQL statements with Java for business logic. And, uh, and that is the transaction, right? So the, the side effects of that procedure commit or they roll back. But there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the procedure and the transaction. Uh, you don't have to write Java by any means to use VoltDB. You can declare um, SQL only procedures directly into a DDL file. You can write Groovy plus SQL statements into a DDL file if you're a Groovy fan. And we do ad hoc basically auto commit on a per statement basis so that you can just sit from a console and, and type SQL and do ad hoc, you know, basically auto commit. Um, so, uh, so why, why have we made these decisions? So three fundamental decisions for horizontal scaling, it's in memory, and there's no client side commit control. Um, so the in memory and the client side commit control decisions, they go together. You know, having one and not the other isn't so interesting, but having them both together is really powerful. If you have both of these things together, it means that a transaction never blocks on a resource. It never needs to block on a disk read because all of the data is available in memory. It never has to block on the network, right? Because it has the entire transaction work to do once it begins. So it doesn't need to hold a lock on data for a long time, waiting for a network trip for the client to decide what to do. This means that in bulk, once a transaction begins, it can run to completion without ever waiting for another resource, right? It has all the resources it needs, right, when it begins to run. It has access to the data it requires. It has all of the SQL and all of the logic that can run. Doesn't need to wait on a buffer cache, doesn't need to wait on disk, and doesn't need to wait on a client to tell it whether to commit or roll back. This is a fundamental uh, combination of, of design points that allows the system to do something really unique. It can run its transactions serially back to back instead of allowing a lot of concurrent access to a piece of data, it can put the transactions serially and then just run them first in, first out. All right, so VoltDB, in a way, is essentially a big uh, kind of NPP FIFO processor, right? So we've divided our server into a set of partitions. Each partition has a FIFO queue in front of it. Every partition has a, a single uh, writer thread in it that has exclusive write access to the data of that partition. It's just pulling transaction requests off of that queue, running them to completion. On a modern computer, this is much, much faster than trying to manage concurrency control to data. It eliminates memory coherency control. It eliminates locking and latching, right? It eliminates uh, the ability to do any kind of concurrency management against data. All of these things thrash memory. They thrash memory caches, and they thrash the memory coherence protocols on a modern computer. You can work, you, and, be much, much faster working in this serial operation. So you're saying there's never a concurrent transaction with VoltDB? In VoltDB, the level of concurrency is the number of independent partitions you have. They're all running transactions independently. So they're concurrent parallel. Yeah, it was more parallel than concurrent, right? And, and, and so but the, remember, the throughput of it, that seems unintuitive to people. Like, oh, wait a minute, how can that possibly be fast? It's fast because the transactions that you're doing tend to be very small, right? They're about looking at a handful of rows along with an input of a, a kilobyte or so, right? And making a decision against it and responding, right? Updating a piece of information, calculating a response, and sending that response back. These transactions, once they're put into the right partition to run, they complete in microseconds, right? They're very, very fast. There's really, it, and VoltDB running SQL is essentially the same as making a function call. Right? All of the data is in memory. Actually, it, it is literally a function call. What happens when you call SQL and whole is uh, we have a plan, basically a prepared statement for that SQL statement. We plug in the parameters to it, and we call across a Java JNI library to a layer to a C++ library, and we say evaluate this plan for me. Right? It's just a C++ function call or a SQL statement. So, Anyway, so that, this, these things together is really fundamentally what makes Volt really fast and really transactional. Every stored procedure it has serializable isolation from all of the other work in the system. It has exclusive access to data in a timeline that's well ordered across the entire cluster. Right? So you end up with extremely strong isolation, transactionality, and the ability to transact really, really fast against in-memory data. Now there were a few hands that went up. I want to stop and ask some questions. Just curious, so are we Machine speed workload. The microphone is moved. The machine speed workload happens at a single partition level. It's happening at hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of events per second. The human scale workload, 
the dashboarding aspect of it, or the kind of the reporting or the alarming aspect of it to an operator is happening in a different time scale, right? That's something that's happening a few times a second, a hundred times a second, a thousand times a second. We see a lot of applications where somebody wants to mutate data really, really, really fast. They want to provide a live dashboard to it. And for whatever reason, when you add up the number of dashboard queries, they're really commonly like 500 to 1,000 of them in a second. Right? And that's a read workload that we can easily scale globally across the system using a combination of materialized views to produce pre-aggregations along with intelligent ranking indexes in each partition. So pretty, pretty typical um, you kind of query optimization techniques. I've talked a lot about horizontal scaling. Uh, you add more nodes to Volt, it gets faster. It's a pretty common concept. Volt is replicated. I want to talk a little bit about replication. Um, and and then I would like to talk about durability, and then I think I'll, I'll bring the, the talk to a conclusion there. We'll be at roughly an hour, and, and I'd like to ask, have a chance to answer any questions people have, either one or one or in a group. Um, so Volt to be is fault tolerant. We don't do log shipping or area style log shipping. I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with different um, um, replication strategies. In VaultDB, we do a logical replication. So when that stored procedure request arrives to the system, we identify which partition it needs to run at, if it's single partition, right, and all of the replicas of that partition. And we hand it off to a sequencer for that partition. So every partition has a sequencer associated to it. That sequencer's responsibility is to order all of the incoming work for this set of logical partitions and to communicate that order to all replicas. All right, so the data begins from a deterministic state at every replica. Everything in bold is strictly deterministic and strictly serial. So the data begins in a deterministic state. The, manip the manipulations you run against it are deterministic. We provide APIs if you want random numbers and time to maintain determinism across replicas. Uh, and so you end up at a deterministic result. At the same time, we do a lot of consistency checking and, and, and hashing of of various input and output to the database to guarantee or to the operator that, that everything has remained consistent and that there's not a defect in the database or the application that violates that. So we do logical replication. That means that the replication that we're doing is happening in parallel across all the replicas of a partition and it minimizes the need for these partitions to communicate with one another before they commit a transaction. Right? Instead, they respond their results back to the sequencer, essentially. The sequencer says, got the same answers from everybody. Everybody gave all the same inputs to all the databases. That's a, a value that we hash. I can respond back to a client. All of this is also um, kind of active-active or master-master, however you want to think about it. When a client gets a response back from a Volt database, the effect of that transaction has been committed at all replicas that have affected data. Right? You always read all of your writes, regardless of where you sent the write and where you sent the read. It's a strictly consistent system in this regard. All of them are Excuse me? All of them are majority. Is it a majority consensus? All or a majority? All. All. Right, so so VoltDB, like I said, it's not a it's not a kind of system that's designed for high availability across a WAN, where you might run it across multiple Amazon availability zones or regions, or have one active database on the West Coast and one active database in London. Right, it's a strictly consistent system designed to run at high speeds on relatively fast local networks. Right, that within a single availability zone or in the back group connected by a network. Right? Um, so, so you so you probably. <laughs> if it was the one in the West Coast, you would probably just have like a company like, that, would, that would happen at some other... Yeah, what we typically see in that case is that people either run independent clusters and then push their data to a common OLAP system, um, or, uh, no, essentially anyone who wants to do high-speed decisioning, no one is willing to pay for the latency cost of actually maintaining an active-active protocol. Right, so all of them are willing at that point to give up some level of consistency, and there's a number of different ways to do that. No one's going to pay for the latency cost of, of managing an active-active database. The only person I know that does that is Google, and they actually do it because they own all the data centers and put GPS clocks on them and use a clock-based ordering protocol, which was actually originally specified in the original H store paper. So they use a very similar protocol. Um, but they're really unique in that they own the network, they own the hardware, they own the data center, uh, and they own all access to the data. So they can do something, that's their F1 or Spanner project if you want to read about it. It's really, it's really kind of cool. Um, the other thing that's really cool about it is it's an argument for consistent databases over eventually consistent databases for transactional oriented applications based upon the experience of their analysts. Um, and so if you think about NoSQL versus consistent SQL oriented systems, 
a really interesting argument for consistent SQL systems. Um, VoltDB, as I've said many times, it's in memory, it's a, fur, a fully durable system. So when I say VoltDB is fully, fully acid, I mean really strictly that the D in durability implies a right to disk. Right? So VoltDB has two features that work in combination to maintain durability. The first is that it produces a point in time snapshot of all of its data. It can put the database in a copy on write mode and flush the copy to disk. Right? Asynchronously with other work going on in the system. Secondly, it maintains a log of all of these incoming transactions. If you want to restore the system back to a durable state, you do two things. The system does this for you automatically as a combined action, but there's two logical steps. First is that you replay the snapshot, right? So you bring the data back to that consistent point in time. And then you replay what we call the command log, this logical log of transactions that have been run since that snapshot was initiated. That brings the data back to a fully durable state. Um, this durability feature is tunable. You can turn it off completely. You can use snapshotting and no command logging. Uh, you can use uh, command logging in both a synchronous and an asynchronous mode. The strictest durability uh, configuration of VoltDB is that you run this command log in what we call synchronous mode, meaning that the log is absent before a response to a client is received. And in this case, um, VoltDB guarantees that when a client sees a response, that the inputs to that, that the, the, the effects of that transaction have been made durable at all replicas, all surviving replicas in the cluster, right? So it's a very strong durability guarantee. Uh, we have customers that run basically in-memory caches without durability, and we have customers that definitely rely on VoltDB as a durable store. So we see both. Um, it's kind of a second aspect of durability. So finally, I want to talk about just very briefly so I have three more, two more minutes left in the time I wanted to allot myself about our export connector. VoltDB has a kind of a, a little bit of a proprietary or different feature. We have tables that you can specify as export tables. They're essentially relational tables that are insert only. And the data that you insert into them is inserted in a transactional context. So if the transaction in the insert rolls back, the insert rolls back. But once that insert commits, that data gets bucketed together with other nearby inserts and handed off to an OLAP system through a connector framework. So we can hand data off to JDBC, to a CSV file, or uh, you know, to a queue like Kafka or RabbitMQ or something like that. And what happens a lot of times in a lot of old applications, you have some process like a session begins, it gets updated really rapidly, and then the session ends. Right? It's kind of a logical pattern. And people want to archive a completed session. So they take all of that update workload, they put that essentially in memory with Volt because their OLAP system can't tolerate an update workload. Once that update is completed, they'll write that complete record to the export table and they'll let the OLAP connector uh, push that data downstream to, uh, to the OLAP system. Building things is a lot of fun, but what really excites me about Volt in particular uh, isn't that it does hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, or that it has a logical active-active replication strategy, or that it runs in the cloud. What really excites me about it is that I see it emerging at the intersection of these two major trends. Right? The fact that we are all online, the fact that we have all of this information uh, that allows people to write algorithms that personalize our responses, and the fact that we're carrying around sensors and devices that allow that personalized interaction to be delivered to us and the data management problem that results from that combination and needing a real-time tool that can handle the ingestion, the decisioning, and the analysis of those inputs. That's what really excites me.